Hello and welcome to program 58 of the Amash Files. And as you know, it's Tuesday. It is Tuesday and it's the 24th of November. Thank goodness I'd written that down. I've not long come off a train from London and I'm having a blonde moment. So, <laughs> and as you'll know, we are on peoplesinternetradio.com and thank you to Stephen Roberts for hosting us this evening. And thank goodness it's a bit warmer. Gosh, when I first arrived in London, I was freezing. It was a bit of a shock. It's normally uh, a bit warmer up there. But anyway, I wanted to just mention something that's been coming up more and more and more, and I'm sure it's, it's uh, the same for all of us. And, it, and it's this, um, and it's about trust. This is very interesting. I'm having it sort of shoved right under my nose time and time again. And, um, and I know some of the people close to me are as well. And I just wanted to, to sort of flag up a little bit of my experience this last few days. I, I went and stayed with some of the most, uh, the most amazing friend. I've known her for many years. And we had meditations and we, we, had, we shared time. And it, you know, it's not all about um, you know, the spiritual stuff. Sometimes it's, about, it's just about having fun and a sing song. And some of these gals and guys are Latin. And, and so they love to, to share. And that is just amazing. But these relationships that I've had with these folks, especially the friend I stayed with, has been built up over many years. But right from the get-go, this was a person who just captivated my heart. She was a complete love bomb. She just is open. And um, when I say open, she's open to the possibility of everybody embracing her love and her love being accepted by others. And it, and it really is just very unusual and, and very beautiful. And um, there are sort of three of us in, in the group um, that are very, very close. And we call ourselves the three musketeers. And, and those two other musketeers, they, they know that um, they could trust me with their souls and their bodies and their lives. And likewise, um, you know, this group, it, it's so amazing. And one of the, my friends said, you do know, Joanne, just how unusual this is. And I thought, you know, it's been a part of my life for 25 more years. And I thought, wow, is it, is it really that unusual? And, and maybe it is. And it seems to me, though, that the idea of, of trust is being brought up time and time again. And there's been one or two issues around myself where I've had to accept and realize that um, one or two people I thought I was close to, not quite in the way I am with those folks, um, that I'd invested a lot of time and energy and love and care in, um, had just turned and, um, and as if it was nothing, as if it was nothing, and um, had demonstrated that they thought it was nothing. And this hasn't just happened once. This has happened, uh, you know, a few times for me. And I know it's happening around some people I know. So it's as if this trust issue, we, you know, if we are being, um, I hate the word scammed, but let's just use it because it's common these days, by false false friends, let's call it, but false trusts. Um, it's amazing. You know, I'm, I'm perhaps a, a, a little bit gullible or naive. I take people and trust people that they show me themselves and, until I know otherwise. Um, but I don't go out to see the otherwise. I, I, you know, hopefully those discerning antenna are well operational. But um, it is an astonishing thing. And to that end, I have to do a lot of trusting and people certainly have to trust me with the most intimate details of uh, their lives often in doing what I do, which is to provide a platform for people to have a safe place in which they can talk about their, let's, I'm gonna call it extraterrestrial contacts. You can call it whatever you like and you can say or believe that it, it's not real. It doesn't matter to me. I know it's real for these folks and that's where I am for them. Now, uh, to, to that end, I've also had some interesting things that have come, come under my radar and one of those things is a guy who's contacted me a few months ago, and I just want to share a little bit of what they, they've said because he's been leading me email by email over several months to a point where there's some information um, which I will share in time, but I wanted to share a little bit about what he, where he was leading me and how he was leading me, and part of that with, with some ancient texts, starting with Nostradamus. And I am going to have to use the old-fashioned magnifying glass here um, because <laughs> this is the kind of text I'm going to have to just read a little bit of. But just so you know, and this, because I want to tell you a little bit about this person. And 
this person has been mentioned in a book, um, and I'll tell you about that in a second, but part of this book called The Star Child Mystery says this, according to some witnesses, aliens claim to have seeded star children on Earth for many millennia and say that great religious figures were alien representatives. I have heard from some sources, including contactees and space nap victims, as well as government figures on both sides of the Atlantic, that this is the true reason for the official UFO cover-up. And that um, admitting the reality of aliens is actually no big deal. However, however, coping with the religious turmoil would be a nightmare if it were made public that aliens claim to have manipulated most sorry, major religious belief systems and who wants to take, you know, who wants to deal with that? Who wants to take responsibility for that revelation that religion perhaps is an alien PR exercise in some ways? So that was kind of just a little bit of briefing. And then they showed me a piece of text from um, a Nostradamus text. Now, apparently in 1994, there was um, in the Vatican uh, several pages found and uh, a guy called Ramati translated them, and this is what he has said. Let me just see if I can get this read for you. Um, hang on, I've got the wrong little bit. <laughs> Bear with me here. So it says, um, the screens of the English have not allowed the extraterrestrials a peaceful descent. That's descent as in coming to the ground. I have seen how many wise ones have been killed. The United States has been made to think that the angels are beasts, some kind of telepathic, um, some kind of telepathic Russian animal. And all the English think of is hunting them down. And they themselves come down here and are killed by a defection of some kind of, by a defection kind of contact. If defective, I beg your pardon. So it's really difficult to read this time you're writing. It is um, imperative that Europe and the United States observe with utmost respect the gifts from the stars, since it is in um, sorry, since it is rarest in those countries to find peers who will testify as to their thought. So it's just a little bit of telling you about what's been what has been seen what has been seen on this planet and what's going on now one of the things that, that has been written in this book as well is about this chap and this is what i want because this is who i'm in contact with and it says the location for this extraterrestrial contact was not especially salubrious so this was a contact with this person who's contacted me now with somebody else who's written this book he said it was a small hotel astride a decidedly smelly smoke, uh, soap factory situated amidst the downtown splendors of Warrington, and that's in the mid of England. Not the most obvious choice for a moment of intergalactic history. Twenty years later, this person, the alien, is still quietly trudging the UFO lecture circuits near their home, again in the middle of England. But he has never had any significant pu publicity for his claim, nor does he even... Uh, want that. It seems he goes about his perceived mission with decorum and patience despite occasionally interjecting the time is now running out. Most people who meet him will not have a clue that he is anything but a tall bearded person with piercing eyes and the odd philosophies who used to make jellies for a living. But if this person's self-conviction is to be believed, he is a good deal more than that. He says that his spirit is from elsewhere, inhabiting an earthly body, which he finds restricting. He is here to warn of disasters looming and cites mystic prophecies from dubious sources. Now he's meaning Nostradamus um, as anyone who might quote the weather report. This person has been an influence in my life. That's the author for many in many subtle ways for a long time, superficially at least. The story is absurd, of course, but there are more secret corners of his experience than ha that have made me sit up and take notice. 
and not to be as entirely dismissive as I might be or any other logical person might be. So this is about trusting as well. And I am trusting this person with my time, my energy, and we will in due course meet. Now, what they're also talking about, just to finish off before we have a song and then we're going to meet my wonderful guest for this evening, I'll tell you about her in a moment. Um, he's talking about some very deep, arcane mysteries and some incredible artifacts that are to be found around the British Isles. And some of those um, artifacts we'll know as the Ark of the Covenant, the menorah, amongst others. Now I'll be reporting in due course once I've had a meeting with this person, which will probably be in the new year now, and um, see what I really think about their story. But this is, you know, again, another level of trust and something that uh, we are challenged with. So it's about, it seems, this moment, this time in our lives about getting the people that we truly have a connection with, a resonance with, on side. And for those who aren't, whether they show themselves to our face or we're shown it by some other means, it means we have to let them go. And we have to be really strong about that. It's a really interesting time. So we are going to play our first song and then we are going to have Miriam Delicata come and share with us her wonderful story. And part of her wonderful story began in 1988 with an incredible encounter. But we will get to that down the line. Miriam has also had a lot of, um, a lot of uh, links with the Hopi and the Hopi uh, Blue Star Kachina prophecy we'll be talking about down the line as well. And her website is the bluestarprophecy.com and you can check that out as we play this song, which is about three and a half minutes long. So take it away. I think it's Spaceman by The Killers. Thank you. We'll speak to Miriam in just a moment. And I think that may mean we are back. So hello and welcome again to the Amash Files. And I have with me Miriam Delicado of the bluestarprophecy.com website. Miriam is a world-recognized extraterrestrial conductee and the author of the book, which is a PDF that you can download, folks, and I do recommend it. I've got through a little bit of it. It's a great read, Blue Star Fulfilling Prophecy, in which she shares details of her contact experiences with tall blondes, our great aunts ancestors, and since childhood, Miriam has been in touch with other worlds and energies of life beyond our Earth's dimensions. So I think it's time for us to say hello to Miriam. Welcome to the Amash Files. Thank you for joining us. Hello, and I uh, just want to say uh, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. And um, I was really listening very intently to the, to the intro that you were sharing, Joanne. And um, I have some things that, uh, as we move along, I'd like to sort of give my input on. Because Lovely. I found that what you were sharing was very interesting. And yeah. uh, it relates to some of my, my knowledge as well. Uh, wonderful. Well, it, it really does seem to be a time of stripping down, stripping back. It, it's really ultra painful. It is not an easy time, but it is a time of great growth. And also those who are standing beside us, wow. And those who we didn't know were there, how fantastic. And sometimes these are very new connections and they're soul connections. And you don't need the 20 odd years to, to know that. You can just know it in a moment. And that's also really exciting. I've got one or two of those coming in. And that's also beautiful and uh, relevant. And we mustn't dismiss those either and be shy of them. That's, that's it. It's about trusting ourselves to, to trust. So, um, yeah, it, it's a good one. So, Miriam, welcome, welcome. And I know um, that you have had a lot of experiences right from the get-go. And... Just want to say that um, you're in Canada, but your your dad was from Yugoslavia. Your mum was from Germany, and right. you, you've been brought up in Canada, as I understand it. That's right. And so, what a wonderful mix there is there. But also, just talking about families, how your father seems to have had some interesting connections that will become obvious down the line. So. Here again, we've got this lineage thing going on of this contact continuing through the line, and we'll explore that as well down the road. But 
I tend to to find it really interesting for people if we can just start at the beginning and just tell us a little bit about your your early years because I know right from a, a very young child you are very aware of uh, being a bit different. Yes. Well, my 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 history as far as my entire life uh, is concerned is 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 interesting. Um, it's sometimes it can be a bit spotty to try and share this massive uh, story in in the course of just a few minutes on a radio program, um, but to talk about the ET contact, I'd like to start there, which happened when I was 22, and then uh, I'll give a bit of an overview to my childhood. Um, so, you know, growing up, I was a very you know, I was just like most other children, or so it seemed. Um, but I didn't, I didn't know at the time that I was a little different in the sense that uh, even when I was about two years old, I would try to read people's minds and things like that. So if, even from a very young age, I had certain abilities that were not, quote, of the norm um, of society. And then as I got a bit older, I had a lot of, quote, psychic abilities that started popping up and creeping up. Um, about the age of 9, 10, they started to become very strong. And during my teen years, I mean, I was very hooked into other worlds. But I didn't understand it. There wasn't any mentors around or places for me to go to figure things out. I was literally on my own. Um, my close friends and family knew about these gifts, but, you know, I didn't, I didn't talk about them very often because they really scared people, actually, especially back then. So, life went on. I, I moved from my small town. Are you there, Miriam? No. <laughs> okay, have we, have we lost sound on Miriam? Lost everything. Lost everything. Okay. okay. Am I still on? <clears throat> there she is. She's back. Oh. Okay. Um, I was with some people on uh, driving on a highway in Canada. We were driving from northern British Columbia to Vancouver, and some very strange lights came up behind us, some big balls of white light. And, you know, the brain has a tendency to try and figure things out in a rational way. Whatever you think rational, you know, think rational is. That's, yeah. Whatever your perception is, that's what you're going to see. I will so, just say, Miriam, sorry, just to interrupt the flow there, I'm sorry about that, but we did lose you just for a, a few seconds leading up to that story that you were, you were in a trip. So just that you were on a trip here and, and you were already um, on your way. So sorry about that. It's just to, that we lost you there. <laughs> so just to say that you were, in fact, on a trip and this is, this is what was going on. Right. I was driving on a highway with um, three other adults and a child in a car, and these lights started following us. And we thought it was maybe a big truck because it was a bit higher up than a normal vehicle. And uh, there was a lot of strange things that were happening as these lights would come up behind us. A, a radio station would come on in the car. Um, the, the lights would fall, you know, simply just fall back and, and disappear if we went through a small town or if a car was coming towards us. This went on for several hours, and after taking sort of a nap in the back of the car, um, myself and another woman went up to the drivers in, in the front. I was the passenger, she was the driver. And at that point, um, these lights were still continuing to follow us. And we were getting very nervous about the situation because it was very, very, very odd. And eventually, uh, we went through a town, a small town, and it's a, it was about it's about two miles, I think, from one end to the other that you can see, you know, from one end to the other. And coming in, you come in from a bit of a hill, and then you leave going up a bit of a hill. And when you do, you're completely in forested area again. So we did this, and I looked behind me, and I said, there is no way that those lights can catch us now. None. There's no way. And then literally, literally, I blinked, and the lights were there.
And the woman that was driving started screaming, saying, I, you said they weren't there, what's happening, I don't understand. And finally I screamed at her and I said, pull over the car, pull over the car, which of course she didn't want to, she was terrified. So was I, really. And um, But I said, no, it's not you they want, it's me. And this came, I think, this thought came as a result of uh, a dream that I'd had earlier, a couple of hours earlier, when two beings came to me sort of in the astral world and said to me, um, we are coming for you soon, do not be afraid, we are your friends, we are your family. So the car pulls over onto the side of the road, all of the, ch the child and the three adults are, are motionless, completely motionless, and I look around and there's light everywhere. The two big huge balls of light are behind the car, and when I look in front, there's a, a UFO that has almost like mist uh, coming off of it. And it was dark, so it was very... It, it was like the mist was, was full of light. It was very interesting. And out of that mist came um, very small uh, beings with round black eyes, but they're not greys. They are not greys, the typical greys that people talk about. Um, they were more childlike, and they led me down a road, down the road, um, the highway, Canada, and uh, there was a much larger craft there, so I walked up an embankment, and going up the embankment, the door of the UFO had um, these tall, blonde-haired, blue-eyed extraterrestrials, two of them, and the thought that went through my mind was, what are you doing here, why can't you just leave me alone? And it was a struggle inside of my mind saying, what? It, it, it's like having three conversations. One saying, um, one saying, oh, can't you just leave me alone? And then another one saying, wait a minute, what's that? And then another one just in, in shock and awe of what's even happening. So I walked on board the craft and um, I, I figured, it took me some time, but I figured out that it was three hours that I was with them. And while I was on board this UFO, uh, I don't remember every minute, every second of my time there, but I do remember some of it. And what they did was they took me to a, a room that had what I call a light chair. And it was just a chair made from light. And I sat in this chair, and then in front of me was a huge projection of images. And these images came up, um, and as they came up, this is, this, is a, this is fascinating, actually, because as they came up, information would be given to me in my mind about what I was seeing. And it's as if instead of just seeing something on a television screen the way that we do, whatever I was seeing on the screen was an experience that was given to me. So I saw the beginning of humanity, the past, the present, the future. I saw potential futures. I saw um, some of the history of our planet. Um, I, I, I was taught a lot about energy and the way that energy works, meaning physics. It's all physics. Um, whether we talk about it as being energy and vibration, or we talk about it as protons, photons, and neutrons, it depends on our language. And so they taught me a great deal about energy and how it works. And what, for me, even all these years later, it's 27 years later, um, you know, I'm still in shock and awe sometimes over the experience because when I was with them as well, they, they, sort of gave me back memories of having encounters with them when I was younger. And these stories are all documented in the book that I give for free at my website, bluestarprophecy.com, as a p free PDF. So I encourage people to, to download it and read it um, because it gives a really good overview with some details of my experience. But you know, that's the physical things that happened. Um, I think we've come a long way in ufology and uh, in trying to understand this subject matter because it's so vast and so complex, as you know, Joanne. Yes, indeed. So 
Did you, were you shown where, you know, just um, like where these folks were from, how long they'd been interacting, what was their, what was their specific role with us here? Well, they are so extraordinary and their energy is so different than anything that I have ever experienced here in this reality of being, you know, living my life here. Um, I did ask them at one point, I said, are you God? Because, <laughs> I mean, you'd have to, you have to have the experience to understand why I was asking that. And they said, no, we are not God. They said, we seek to know God as you seek to know God. Um, but our understanding of, of God and, and, um, the energy of everything that exists is far greater than us as human beings and what they know I they say that human beings can't quite they were not quite ready to comprehend it but if we think about God in the sense of the, the energy and the essence of all life and what or who or how that is they they are there as well so it's as though they're they're from um, they're from um, just a more evolved uh, place. Now, where they're from, I, I always like to make it clear that these beings I call the tall blondes. And it's important to note that these are not Arcturian, Syrian, uh, Syri Sirius, uh, Arcturian, Pleiadian, tall blond, tall whites. You know, all of these other races that are out there. This is a very specific race, the tall... Um, so, so not the Nordics either, or did you say that? <laughs> no, they're not the Nordics either. Okay. But they did say that they are related to, to a number of these other um, groups that are out there. And what they told me, the tall blondes, was that they're the caretakers of the earth. And what that means is, because people say, well, if they're doing a pretty lousy job. And I say, no, 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 no. That doesn't mean they're the controllers of the earth and human beings. It means that they're the caretakers of earth. They had a hat, they had, um, a, they had a role in creating the human bodies that we currently exist in. And again, people say, oh, that was the Anunnaki, that was this, that was that, you know, this is that bad evil group that, that um, made us into slaves. No. If, if we feel that way as, as a soul, as a soul, I have the free will to come into this body, but I have the free will to go into, a, into an extraterrestrial body as well. It's really important that people understand that, that piece of information because um, where do they think that the human being came from? It didn't just uh, it appear. Um, the tall blondes told me that they had a hand in helping to create human life and that they were guided to do so through the connection that they have with quote god or the creator itself it's so complicated it's a it's a it's a very complicated big story yeah so um did they would they give you a location i mean you know we us humans love nuts and bolts and you know how do, what does it feel like <laughs> did, <laughs> well, well, they did say uh, they did say that they have that they're from many different places. Meaning, they're from some of them live on other planets. Some of them live in the other dimensional worlds. Some of them live under the earth, and some of them live on very large craft that are you know out there within our our known existence. So there are all of those places that they currently exist. And what they're able to do because of different understanding of energy. And this is a technology, you see. It's not, we, we have access to it. We just don't know how to access it, if that makes sense. Um, they have the ability to t travel through time, to travel um, interdimensionally, different ways that they're able to interact with human beings on the planet. Um, essentially, though, if if one were to say where are they from, you know you can take it to that to 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 that that one 
um, that one step out and say, oh, they're from this star or from that star. I don't ever remember what star system they said they were from. I don't remember. And I'm too, you know, I'm too nervous about asking because of my own personal filter. Um, I would want to make sure that I got that right. Yeah. Uh, but talking about the creation of life itself, okay, yeah. when, when, Intel, in, intelligent life was created, let's say, when intelligent life was created, it was uh, a mass of, um, I, 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 sorry, I, I have to, I'm going to just stop, <laughs> try that again. I gave this description recently to someone about a bag of sugar, okay, and I'm, I'm going to try to use this analogy again because it worked really well and everyone loved it. Imagine that you have a, a, a bag of sugar and each one of the, the small tiny crystal uh, crystals Great. of sugar okay, is in the bag. Well, let's say that as you get closer and closer and closer and closer to the center, the sugar becomes much more compact. It's harder. And so the deeper you go, the, the harder it gets. Well, in the beginning of creation, this is what the ETs told me about how life was created and who we are and who they are. So in the beginning, there's God, the creator of everything that exists, okay? And that's not them. We, God said, okay, we're going to, I'm going to create life. And so this bag of sugar the grains of it were strewn and thrown out all over the existence in every direction. And it was conscious life. Well, at the outside of the bag of sugar, these grains, these little crystals, are very loose. So they went out first, and those are the less evolved. They have less of the knowledge of the whole, you see? less of the knowledge of the whole. The closer you get to the center, the more knowledge you have of the whole and being connected to everything. So these beings come from closer to the center of where this uh, energy of our souls and of, of our beings actually came from. That's where they ultimately came from and that's where we are from as well. Do they give you any um, understanding or information about how the God element or particle or being was brought into, how that manifested? The question of all time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think that's yes, I know, that's fine. <laughs> that's, I think that's far above our ability to understand. Um, yeah. And, and that's if they give you any hint or whatever. Well, but. that's something that I tried to ask <laughs> because I wanted to know. And that's where they were saying, look, you're not going to understand. You have to evolve a bit further before we can get to that point. But the God particle, the particles of God itself, I can tell you a lot about those particles and how they work and how they interact and what they do. But who and what created them, no, I, I can't. I can't explain any of that. So that was a, a huge experience for a 22-year-old who'd, you know, spent, you know, the, the last, I don't know, seven or eight years really making your own way through the world after yes. difficulties at home. I mean, none of it was easy, your, your movement through from, from sort of mid or early mid-teens onward. It was a real, um, I don't know, baptism of fire is what I can say. And uh, wow, you you know, you're doing an amazing job, Miriam. Because I know just a little bit about that and how hard that would be. So, so although you've had all these other experiences, sort of this must have been a sort of a culmination of a of a coming together. I imagine of a lot of the other experiences that you'd had and not understood them. Did this? Was that true? Did it bring together a lot of understanding? Did that? It, it, it shifted my, um, completely shifted my reality of understanding the reality that was around me. And, and it was, I think, um, 
maybe a way of explaining it would be the you know all of a sudden realizing that I don't know anything and that we don't know anything about what's really you know who we are where we're from what we're doing here and life itself it really did bring together a lot of the pieces of my life that's that 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 I always questioned there were moments in my life uh, for example when I was about 16 there was an incident on a, a logging road with a couple of people that I had and I saw what I thought were uh, shooting stars but when they got to the earth they 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 flew parallel and I never forgot that but I couldn't tell you anything else about what happened and mm -hmm. You know, there are a couple of other details, but we don't have time to, to share every detail in the show today. Um, some of it's in the book. Um, so all of those pieces started to all of a sudden fit together. And also this feeling that I had, for example, um, when I was 9, 10, 11 years old, I used to have this, this feeling that when I got older, I would do something really significant um, to help people in some way. And I remember... I remember contemplating that and thinking, what on, you know, what am I going to do? What on earth could I possibly have to offer anyone? And then when the experience happened, uh, there was something unique about the experience. Um, and that is, when I walked off that craft, they literally said to me, you will remember this. You will remember. And they asked me specifically to... Um, share it with people. They specifically asked me to actually share it with people. Um, and that I think is a unique uh, trait in, in people who have been taken on board craft. And let me, let me say this, because this for me is a, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue within the UFO community that bothers me a great deal. The, the, the clarity, there's, there's mm -hmm. an issue here. I've had this experience 27 years ago, taken on board a UFO, physically taken on board a UFO when I was 22 years old. And for these 27 years, I've listened to a lot of people who have had ET contacts and experiences say, oh yeah, I'm taken all the time. And they relate it as if it was something similar to an experience where you've been physically taken. And I have to say, it's not. It's not the same. It is not the same. There is, there are a lot of inconsistencies within the UFO community that need to be made clear by everyone in the field, including contactees and abductees like myself, because astral contact is very powerful and there's a lot of emotion and physical things that happen and people may even see an opening to the, um, it's like they're saying, you know, someone saw me get taken, yeah. but they actually ha saw the doorway into the astral. That was not physical. It still wasn't physical. We have to be very careful about what is physical and what's not. And I've had discussion with a few other people who are um, physical contactees, physically taken on board UFOs, and uh, hands down, we all agree that this is an area that needs to be cleared up. Okay, well, that's interesting. I hadn't really uh, thought about that um, uh, as an issue, but it's interesting because obviously you you are that person who is looking at it from, from your perspective of being a contactee. Would you call yourself an abductee as well, or is that not occurred for you? I, I no, absolutely. I would con I would call myself a contactee, an abductee, an experiencer, a, a, a seeker, all of those things. Um, I, I think that it's really important that uh, this this phenomenon begin to break things down to a, a whole nother level of where we have been for many years now. Uh, in the beginning, um, 30, 40 years ago, we were very limited in our understanding. Now we're at the point where there's a saturation of information that's being shared in the community. We have to now take the, all that saturation of information and say, what is it that, that we really need to understand? Or what do we need to have dialogue about to understand? Yeah. I agree because with you. Um, because at the beginning of the program, you were talking about the gentleman who you you have contact with, 
Um, I do agree that a lot of religions, as an example, have been created. I think that religion has been created out of some extraterrestrial contacts that took place. Yeah. And that then those religions were twisted to then make it so that it's not the ETs again, that it's yeah, absolutely. You know, something else. Absolutely. Yeah. 100%. And it's kind of like that. It's sort of like that with physical contact and astral, because I've had both, and both of them are. They are significant. They are significant. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So here you are, 22 years old. My goodness, and you had this amazing, mind-blowing, awesome experience. How on earth did that make you feel? And, and what did you do with that information and knowledge? I laugh. <laughs> okay. Okay. I. I How long have we got? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I do. Hey, um, no, I, I, this is this is one of the most, uh, you know, this is something I, I try to keep it real. I, I've got this new motto and I keep saying it because I want to keep this real. Um, for the first couple of years after the experience, I think I was crazy. I think that um, looking back on it, I don't even know how I made it through those first couple of years. Uh, it took a lot for me to be able to handle what was happening around me. It was not just the, I mean, God, all of a sudden I went from understanding that we were not alone and that there was actual, quote, aliens and extraterrestrials around and they, you know, I just saw them and touched them and, and been with them to being, uh, you know, people trying to recruit me into uh, psychic programs in the in Russia. Um, I had uh, a lot of ex-military people coming around. I had some ex, quote, ex-FBI, ex this, ex that coming around my, me in the first couple of years after the experience. So how did they find out? Well, part of that's in the book. Part of that's uh, things that I've still kind of put together after. Mary, um, tell us about the recruitment business big, uh, uh, issue, because that uh, or element, because that was that's very interesting, and it does bring your father into it a little bit. Because I think if you kind of mention what happened to him, uh, as well as a precursor to them, what happened to you, and how you didn't understand it in the interim, uh, I think this is very powerful and interesting, and it just shows that when you are at a certain level of awareness or vibration, that you are like a little beacon. You, one, anyone. Um, yes. who has that level of uh, attainment, whether you're conscious of it or not. Absolutely. Um, my father used to, my father was a very different kind of a man. He, he first of all, he was in the war in, in Europe. He was literally, uh, all of the boys in his village that he lived in growing up, um, the, they came in army trucks and literally picked up the children off the streets, threw them into the back of the truck, and took them away. That's what happened to my father. Um, he hid in the bushes for a day, or he was out in the bush, and the other boys said, oh, the, he's back there, and they went back and got him. So I just want to make that, you know, I just want to share that. Um, so he grew up in the war, and he was a little crazy. <laughs> Rightfully so, I think. Can I just um, ask why? Why were they taking them? Were they? Were they? Was this conscripting them? They, uh, they were. They took all of the boys in order to fight. Oh, and okay. I don't yes, know which yes, side that's what I picked up to fight. I, I don't know which one it was. He ended up fighting for three different armies during the war. He got passed around, and it was really a kind of incredible. And he's highly intelligent. My father is highly intelligent, one of the most intelligent men I've ever known. He was a healer when I was growing up. He was a great healer. He healed a lot of people in all over. People would call him and say, you know, cancer, all sorts of things. He, you know, he he healed people. And um, one of the great, one of the greatest herbalists that I've ever known in my life. I've never met anyone that knows uh, as much as my father, even today. People that say, "Oh, I know about herbs." They don't know anything compared to my father. Now, the reason that this is important is because when I was growing up, he used to tell me a story, and I'll tell you that in a moment. Um, but the minute I walked off the craft, within a day. 
within a day to two days, I all of a sudden realized I looked at my father's life and I thought, oh my God, he had contact. It's the first thing that I, I realized, he's had contact because he used to talk about the end of the world. He used to talk about what we needed to do. He used to talk about um, being just things that these beings had shared with me about the potential future of humanity disintegrating into chaos. And I realized, and plus my father was very psychic. And he always used to tell me this story about being on the streets in Paris and someone approached him to be in what he called the Russian psychic army. And that this Russian psychic army, he said, it, if they ever come to you, don't, don't ever go to them. Don't ever go with them. Don't ever go with them because you can never leave. And I thought, oh, this man is crazy. He's, I don't know what he's talking about. But then, after, when I, after my, my abduction, my contact, whatever you want to call it, um, a man just came walking in off the street into a little yogurt shop that I worked at. And he literally, the very, very, very first thing he ever said to me was, Have, do you work for the CIA or the FBI? And I said, no. And I joked just like that. And I said, no, I, I'm, what are you talking about? And he didn't, he didn't flinch, and he just kept going on this, and um, it scared me. I was, you know, I was a young girl. I was terrified. I'd already seen aliens. I mean, that was, that was enough. But now to have government agencies coming after me and realizing this goes back for how many years from, from my father? Well, what is this? How far is this going to go? What's going to happen here? And he started talking to me about um, about what he called uh, uh, a Russian psychic program where there was an entire community of people that were all gifted, that all had psychic gifts, that all lived together. And he said, you know, you really should think about coming because he said you would never be alone again. He said you'll be surrounded by people like yourself. He said we will train you. You will become very powerful. And I thought, wow. So I just, you know, all I said to him was, please go back to the people who sent you. Tell them thank you very much for the interest. I'm not interested now, nor will I ever be. So there's no point in ever um, having anyone return. But I do appreciate the offer. And I left it at that. So... That was the story of, um, that was one of the little things that happened in my life. And as you can imagine, being 22, 23 years old, I don't even know how I got through it. I, especially in that environment when, when people were not talking about this. Yeah. And also what it was that alerted them so quickly to you. I mean, that, that is really quite an astonishing thing that it happened so fast and they were so eager to try and uh, convince you to come along. When you said no uh, and um, thank you very much, was that the end of it or did they follow up with any kind of, you know, requests over the years or even worse? Did, have, have you had any military involvement or my lab kind of experience or anything like that with your obvious abilities? No. People try to convince me that I have because they want to go down the conspiracy theory, um, you know, the conspiracy theory and say that, you know, they want to just say whatever they want. And I haven't. Um, my, my, I have a very strong mind. And I mean very strong mind. Um, I don't see any way possible, even back then, that had I have had any kind of a uh, my lab situation, that I wouldn't have some kind of recollection of it. Yeah. Um, there's just I just don't see that as happening. Uh, what what I do know is that 
there was a period of about two years after from 1988 till about 1991 and then I think about halfway through 1991 I just shut down I said that's it we're done I'm done I, I just stopped talking to people because I was having I was having people come to me off the street with strange uh, requests of wanting to talk to me and people taking my photographs and all of my mail being ripped open. Um, uh, nobody could send anything to me through the mail and I couldn't receive anything through the mail. All of every, on both directions it would be opened up blatantly and blatantly taped back together again. Um, strange little markings on the back of the letters when I would receive them that I still have by the way which was happening at that time in the phenomenon and that was also we have to remember that at that time in the in this field people were getting killed so yes. yeah, um, um, people were definitely getting killed and with the amount of attention that I was I was having there's there's a lot to this story around that two years and um, just recently, I've been working towards wanting to share more of those details. So I'm, you know, I have my website in place. I have that going. My blog's there. I'm slowly building that. I'm getting into the routine of adding to that. And now I'm going to start doing um, video, a little bit more of a video blog to really start getting into some of the details, details, details of all of this. Okay. Well. What did you do with that information? What, what, how did you begin to live your life after that? Because this must have impacted you so deeply that you must have felt it meant something in, in terms of you, you doing something with it. Or, or, or am I wrong in that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, because they gave me, a, they gave me what, you know, quote unquote, a mission. They told me exactly what they wanted me to do. They wanted me to come forward to the public, to tell them about, to talk about the extraterrestrials and share all of the information that they shared with me when I was on that craft. Um, they, they gave me very clear instructions and I have been sort of, quote, following them for years now. Uh, I think it was around 1991 that I finally shut down and said, okay, I have to stop talking because otherwise something, you know, bad might end up happening to me. Uh, a lot of people in my life, my friends, my family were fearful for my life because they didn't know what was happening, but they just saw yeah. things and they were like, what are you doing? What is this? So the star beings came to me and they said, you know, you you have to, st we have to, we have to silence this or you're going to be killed. They actually came because we had tele I have very clear telepathic communication with them for those two years. And they came and said, you need to make a decision. Do you want to stay on Earth and live as a human being until we come back and reactivate you? Or you can go to a secluded location that we will provide and we'll take you with us until it's time to do your work. Your choice. They gave me the choice. Oh, wow. Okay. That's interesting. So it took me three days of contemplation and I decided to stay here and live life. Um, and so that's what I did. I, I decided to stay here and live life. And then in 2003, I was, quote, kind of reactivated to go to work. And that's when, that's when the Hopi come back into it um, as far as what happened in 2003 with the ETs. And then since then, it's it's a very interesting life journey. Okay, well, listen, this sounds like a great time, great point to, for you to have a break. And we've got David Bowie. And um, now, what did I choose? Was it the Starman song? <laughs> <Was> it <laughs> oh my God, that running off the train is just out of my brain. <laughs> anyway, so listen, folks. Enjoy Davey Bowie, whatever he's singing, and we'll see you in about three and a half minutes. And this is definitely another blonde moment in the Amash Files. <laughs> Miriam, we'll see you after the break. All right. <laughs> in the Amash Files with Miriam Delicado, part two. Ah, thank you, Miriam. So that is, uh, you know, absolutely fascinating. And of course, so you've written your, your book um, about this uh, whole thing to share as they'd asked you, these beings. 
we haven't really mentioned your family so far. How, how did they take all of this or, or did you share with them? <laughs> Another chuckle comes up. <laughs> um, you know, it took me a long time to tell my family. Uh, it, it took me a very long time to tell my family. Um, can you just hold on for just a moment? I need to do something here because it's too distracting for me. Um, don't mind me. I'm going to, I'm just, the little thumbs up on the Skype is flashing and I, I can't, it's too okay. distracting for me. I just had to make it move up. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so my family, you know, it took me, it took me years to be able to, to tell every member of my family and I did it, did it one at a time. Um, my father, of course, people are most interested in. When I told him, it, it, had, it was about two years after the fact. And I never told him anything about the spiritual, um, you know, part of the experience or anything like that. I talked to him about just the actual event itself, the car, the ETs, sitting in the light chair, past, present, future, he kind of flipped out when I told him. And the first thing he said to me was very interesting because it was the first confirmation. Um, you see, when I was on the UFO, a memory came back to me of me being in my crib and these beings hovering around me and me seeing them when I was a baby. Now, uh, I was 24 years old when I told him the story, my father. And then this is his first reaction to me. He said, um, wh why didn't you tell me? He said, why didn't you tell me before now? He said, maybe I could have stopped them. Those blah, 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 bleep, 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 bleeps. They, the worst they ever were with me was 24 years ago. They would never leave me alone. Now, I had a memory of being a baby and them hovering over top of me, and then my father said that to me. So that was a really big confirmation. So he was very aware of them, and he said to me, he actually said to me, what do, what do they want from you? What do they want? What do they want you to do? And I said, well, they want me to, 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 to share this story with the world. And he was very upset, and he said, you, it, they'll destroy your life. He said, don't do it. He said, human beings are not worth it. They will never change. So it wasn't, you know, it's sort of like what he was saying is, I think he tried to do work to help people and he was, he'd only suffered as a result of it. And he was trying to say to me, if you try to help people in any way with any of this stuff that people don't quite understand, you're going to suffer. Are you still there? Did I just lose you? Uh, yep, we just lost her. <laughs> Am I still on? Yes, you're okay, still on. Well, I'll just, just keep chatting on. then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, this, this, the idea of uh, being with my family um, had completely changed after this experience. It was completely and totally different because of my understanding and my relationship with with everyone um, and my sisters uh, back then they were very concerned because when I first told them the story of my experience and what happened both of them said the exact same thing to me they both I asked them this question today they don't remember saying this um, but they both said to me where's my sister what have you done with her you're not my sister because I told them on the phone I didn't tell them face to face and I sounded so completely different than uh, what I normally sounded like as quote Miriam and what's interesting about that is that I actually looked different after I walked off the UFO I sounded different um, the way that I expressed myself was completely different. So there was a lot of change in me after, uh, after the experience of when I was on board the UFO. Nice to see you back, Joanne. <laughs> I, was, I was trying to creep in there, <laughs> hoping nobody would notice. 
all right. Talking to myself as I was. <laughs> so the, 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 the family dynamic was very difficult for a very long time because they thought I was crazy. Um, but there were parts of it that they, they knew that I wasn't. So I think they had a struggle as well. Uh, in later years, my older sister, who, whose home I'm in right now, um, it's who I live with. Uh, my older sister, she she had an experience as well when I was when I was a child when I was four years old and she was about eight or nine, and where we saw a UFO together actually, and then we all remember a time when I was about nine years old when I woke up, and my mother and older sister were sitting at the kitchen table, and I said to them, "Oh, I had this very strange dream." And, and about a UFO landing in the backyard. And they said, what? We were just talking about that. So they both had the dream that a UFO landed. So the three of us sat at the kitchen table waiting for my other sister to wake up. And when she did, they, we, we just looked at her and said, did you dream about anything last night? She said, yeah. So all four of us had a, quote, dream that a UFO landed in the backyard. But that's all we remembered. So the family has always sometimes had different things. All, all of my family, myself and my two sisters, my two sisters have a little bit of um, intuition, psychic ability, but not to the same level as I do, that's for sure. Um, my father, of course, was heightened psychic ability, and my mother was my mother. But my mother was also brilliant and very high intelligence also. So years later in life, my father, after writing the book, um, he was very proud of the work that I was doing, and he was happy for me, and he was really happy about me working with the Hopi, and, you know, even though he didn't quite understand <laughs> what I was doing with them, I don't think anyone does, but that's all right. Um, and so I, I just, I, I know that this subject when we're talking about UFOs, extraterrestrials, God, um, angels, uh, creators, interdimensional worlds, it's all related to yeah. to so many different things. Um, it is. It, it is. And, and this sort of brings us nicely into, I think, your link with the Hopi. Um, and, and that's a really big part of what's been going on for you, this connection with the Hopi. And I think that, it, I think people would be absolutely fascinated to hear not only about your, your links with them and how those came about, but also about their prophecies and how you feel perhaps those are feeding into this time right now. Well, I like to, you know, it's very important for me to have, um, uh, be very clear uh, in regard to my relationship with the Hopi because there are many prophecies that are out in the world, for example, um, everything from biblical prophecies to different indigenous peoples to, you know, different individuals who have come up uh, in the last hundred years and talked about visions that they've had of things that are coming in the future. So. It is interesting that the Hopi have one of the most uh, talked about prophecies on the earth because it's very simple, straightforward, to the point, accurate. I think that's why the, the Hopi have had a lot of attention. That's one of the reasons. Um, when I was in, on board the craft in 1988, I talk about this. When I was on board the craft in 1988, the beings, the tall blondes, showed me images of a group of people that they told me that one day I would find. And that this group of people knew all about them. This is what the ETs said, to make this clear. This is what the ETs said. They said, um, this group of people that you will find know all about the existence, they know all about life, they know all about the energies, etc. And they said, uh, they said, you need to find them. So I thought, great, <laughs> where on earth am I supposed to look for these beings? I mean, come on now, am I going to find them in the jungles in South America? Because if these, be if these people, this group of people truly has 
has maintained this knowledge for thousands of years, which is what the ETs said, I thought that's where they would be. So again, a lot of detail shared in my book about how I came to be in the area. There's more to that story that in the next while I'm going to start sharing more detail to the story as I'm putting it out through my website and my blog and all of that. Um, but, sorry, I, I'm kind of, I have to take a moment to, to sort of That's pull okay. this story together. So, in 1991-92, around that time is when I sort of shut down from being with the ETs. And I remained silent for many years. Then in 2003, I woke up and I'd had this incredible dream. Um, uh, and it was like a, uh, it was like being reactivated. All of a sudden, the ETs were back and they said, time to go to work. Time for you to go to work. Time for you to go to work. And I was like, what? What does this mean? So I was compelled, I mean absolutely compelled, to go to the Four Corners area of Arizona, which is around, um, which was around uh, um, Arizona, Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, and Colorado. And when I did this journey with a dear friend of mine, we ended up going through Hopi land, and we were at a small cafe that's that's just on the edge of it. And when I was in there, when I was walking back out, there were all these Hopis that were sitting there having lunch. And in a split second, I had like what I call a psychic flash, and they completely changed um, their appearance. They didn't look human. And that's when it was like a rush of information that said, this is who you're looking for. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh my gosh. So I went home, and I was very, you know, um... I was very moved by the experience and I, I started to read up about them on the internet and trying to figure things out and there was these connecting dots that, that get a bit convoluted. And I realized very, very, very quickly that um, when I read their prophecy, and they have a prophecy called the Blue Star, and um, the Blue Star Prophecy, that's what, how it's listed in the public. And it says the Blue Star Prophecy, or the Blue Star Kachina. And they talk about this, and they say that in the public, um, that uh, one day the Blue Star will return. I'm just going to leave it at that. I'll let people research on their own. And when I read certain pieces of the prophecy, I realized that it was absolutely identical. And I don't mean just a little. It was absolutely identical to what the information from the extraterrestrials were. For example, uh, in 1988, young, naive girl was told that we had lived in... Um, the three, three prior worlds had existed and that we were living in the fourth world. And then the Hopi in their prophecies and what they were talking about said that we were also living in the fourth world. And they said that the description of each one of the other worlds was, again, identical to what I was told by the ETs and so forth. So then, when I went through Hopi the following year, um, I went to just simply share with this woman... Um, a little bit of what I was experiencing, but I never used the term extraterrestrials or aliens. I only said I was given a vision and premonitions and I have understanding and this is what it is. And that's how it started. And she, without me asking, took me to an elder in one of the villages and that's when the dialogue began. And quite literally, I was led to go back there at certain times to give certain messages to, you know, different things. And the relationship um, grew over time. And I have to say that in eight, the first eight years of going to Hopi, in eight years, I never asked them a single question. Not one. Not one. Not What's that? What is that kachina? What is that doll? What does that mean? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And so things had to either unfold or not. And then after the eight years, the only questions I ever asked had to do with what I had to know in order to do to be able to fulfill things that they asked me to do. 
um, to help them and support them in any way. F for example, when they had um, uh, a recent issue with um, some water rights and the, the government was trying to take away their, water, their rights to water that's on their land, they asked me to come out there and help them with that. Um, I helped to bring um, uh, public attention to their fight against uh, a proposed constitution that would have literally annihilated their way of life. Um, I was out there for five months doing that at one point. So these are really important issues and right now I'm helping them with other things that, um, um, you know, I, I'm always doing something. It depends on, on to what degree that I'm, that I'm doing it. But when it comes to the prophecies of the Hopi, they, they are very well respected within the quote indigenous world community. I have seen this from my own, from my own eyes. Um, I also, through all of the experiences I've had with all of these different indigenous, believe that the Hopi are one of the most knowledgeable and still intact societies left on earth. Um, certainly with, pro with issues that they have that they're facing as everyone else, but how this ties into ufology is really interesting because then you can take it into the history, the actual history, the archaeology, the the mythical stories and piecing that all together I think that's that's a job for scholars not for me um, but it's definitely something that is coming out in bits and pieces within ufology and so I still have a very close relationship with them um, and at some I would love I would love to ask you about the language and about your your the time with a little girl that um, <clears throat> I either heard or read about, I can't remember which now, and how you actually recognize as she spoke to somebody else in the Hopi language, you, your ears pricked up because yeah, you recognize. That is, that is actually one of the more interesting um, moments for me, for sure. Um, it was the first time really that I was taken to the elder, uh, you know, and I was in the village, first time I was really there. And in my back pocket, I had a list of words that the, quote, extraterrestrials had talked to me about. Um, and I, I didn't know what they meant. But this one word sounded, they used it a lot and often with me. And I have a guide that's a female, and she used to say this one word to me all the time. That I and I would come out of these astral, you know, tours that they would give me, and sometimes I would write down this language. So they would speak to me in this other language there, but I and I knew what they said, but I couldn't, you know, put the actual word together with the the translation word. So I was in Hopi piece of paper in my back pocket, 20 words written down on it, and the little girl starts to speak Hopi, and I hear one of the words. I, that, that was another life-changing moment for me, because I immediately said to her, what, what did you say? And she said, what, what? And I said, that word that you just said, and I tried to, I, I said it, and, and I said, what, what does that mean? And she said, it means thank you, in Hopi, it means thank you, a woman who says thank you. And I thought to myself, my God, that, that for me was um, an incredible synchronistic moment of, of, acceptance in realizing that all of the stories that these ETs had shared with me were at, were truthful and they were becoming more and more real and more and more clear to me all the time. And so I went to the elder and I told him what happened and he was freaked right out because I pulled out the piece of paper out of my back pocket and I said, I, I'm, I came here with this. And he looked at me, and a number of the words that are on that um, were, were on that paper were Hopi. And it was years later that I was talking to someone that knows Hopi language about that, 
and they were freaked out also because you see in Hopi society they have a daily language normal language that they use everyone knows it there's nothing you know there's it then they have ceremonial language where in the ceremonies they they use these certain words and only the people within the ceremonies are allowed to know those words because they're sacred and then there's ancient Hopi that they don't they don't use anymore or it's not used very often maybe in one ceremony or something and it was actually the ancient language that was written on the paper so it's it's fascinating I mean that's phenomenal isn't it I mean that is really just extraordinary well I think we may have lost Miriam again well, for I'm back Oh, yay! <laughs> it's like hide-and-seek. <laughs> Your video's not back yet, though. Uh, sorry? Her video's not back. Oh, no. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. All righty. So, Miriam, you can still hear. <clears throat> oh, there you go. There, there you go. That's absolutely great. So, you, so, again, this work, it sounds like it's very much driven through soul, through, through spirit, and that's what's driving you forward. In, in all of this, not only with doing the humanitarian work, which is, is clearly, you know, what you've just been describing in terms of helping them with their water issues. And isn't it just absolutely unconscionable that we would even think about doing this to these people? I just, you know, truly could just give me Tourette's, but <laughs> I'm reining all that in. <laughs> so. Yes, yes, yes. Well, oh. <laughs> when it comes to when it comes to um, you know extraterrestrials, people often want to look at the details of w the craft and yeah, you sure. know the really material we we solid know. things. <laughs> it's and it's you know we do need to know that, but um, ufology is so complicated because it really touches everything. It, it touches into every society, every belief, every religion, every everything. And when it comes to the indigenous, this is where, quote, the extraterrestrials, the tall blondes, gave me a lot of insight into, into life. Because what they said was in the third world, they took some people off planet... Um, and then protected them until it was time to bring them back. And then they told me, this is what they said to me in 1988, they said, when, when we brought you back, when we brought them back, um, they are now the indigenous. And the indigenous were, were made to, um, to, to, they were given the prophecies. That's where some of these prophecies come from. That's why they're, they're similar or almost the same. Uh, because these prophecies were given about if this ever happens, this is what you do. If this happens, this is what you do. If this happens, this is what you do. And in relation to, for example, the extraterrestrials, it is interesting how in the last couple of years people are starting to come forward from those communities and set, use the language of star beings and from the stars and so forth. Again, I think there's caution. Um, I would just caution people. Because in ufology, it's very, it, because of its level of complexity, it has the, uh, it, it is easily, quote, infiltrated by people who want to give you misinformation, mislead you, take your money, uh, you know, make themselves into little gurus, become rich and famous. There's a lot of that that happens in this uh, genre because it's so confusing people don't know what's what I'm not saying that I have all the answers and that I'm right what I'm saying is I ask people to just really use caution when when following a, a, a certain thread of information and try to sit with it within yourself to see if it feels right for you yeah. because for example there's an individual out there who I actually had a hand in making famous and um, this individual had limited knowledge, exceptionally limited knowledge about the star beings um, and 
he, he's moved himself forward to such an, so, to so much further forward because he started researching it himself and now he speaks as though he's an expert on it but when I met him he knew very 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 little about it and it's to the point now where he's been um, literally cast out of his uh, indigenous community literally thrown out, out of the house off the land don't come back I'm not sharing this to say I mean, I think it's important to, to to share something like this, not to point a finger at that individual or to badmouth an individual, but to say, look, within ufology, especially when it comes to the indigenous knowledge, we have to be very respectful of those communities that hold that knowledge and ask one question. When we're listening to someone, are we listening to one person or are we listening to a community? And who is that person within the community? And have we vetted that? Have we asked those questions? Um, because even people that are saying, I'm an expert, I know what I'm talking about, um, it, it's just very challenging. And I think that that goes back to, Joanne, the very beginning of the show, Absolutely. when we were talking about trust. Mm -hmm. Who do we trust? Mm -hmm. Well. True. I trust myself, I trust myself, and I trust the people that come to me. I want, I'm, I'm open with that, but it doesn't mean that I follow anything blindly. And that's part of the message that the tall blondes have shared with me in asking others to hear that part of the message, which is we have to use discernment in what information regardless of what it's about, whether it's about um, religion, beliefs, ufology, spiritualism, psychic ability, anything, we have to first go to ourselves and ask ourselves within if it's right. And then we can start to follow it. But following blindly what other people are saying, it's just creating a lot. I've seen so much chaos in this, in this industry. And I'm very vocal about that. <laughs> I'm very vocal about how... No, you know, I think we, that's fine. We need to, to get clarity. I, I'd rather not candy coat it and make the situation more confusing. I think it's great. You know, it's, um, it's great to hear an experiencer speak what they have to say on this level too. You know, it's, um, I can speak for all, uh, you know, the tea in China, but it's great when it comes from you guys. I've got a, an, uh, just a, a little, I don't know, it's more of a comment or as, a, as, as much a question. Uh, from Davy in Scotland, all the way there. I bet they're having some fun time weather-wise. <laughs> says, what is your take then, um, Miriam, on the view that we don't all come from the same place? I that there are some people here incarnate on the planet who who um, are from elsewhere. But what's your take on that? I think is what David's asking. So if we take well, it back to the that's a day, day, David, 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 David Monroe. David. David Monroe. Davey Monroe. Well, Davey, thanks for the question. Um, uh, great question. Well, take it. Let's go back to the bag of sugar. <laughs> <laughs> Some of those grains of crystal went out towards one particular planet, and so that that soul, that being, continues to reincarnate onto that planet. For example, in whatever form that is some souls will continue to move through the existence and will end up on another planet incarnated into another type of, of being this is what uh, this is what our souls are that we are travelers we can be within the other dimensional worlds and never have come into human body before and be here now for example we could have had ten lifetimes from Sirius B and then come into form, physical form of a, a human being now. So when I, when I say I am not from here, what I mean is that none of us are, in fact, none of us are actually from here. We're not from Earth. None of us are Earth souls. <laughs> so this isn't the fact, to, to, to put some humor to it, we're not the factory of souls in, on earth. You know, that comes from the creator. 
that comes from the creator. So the, the soul, and, and let me break this down. There's the soul and then there's the spirit. So it's mind, body, spirit, and soul. There's the four aspects that we have. The mind is the mechanism by which the body regulates its energy. This is why it's important for us to keep our minds clear, to help the synapsis uh, flow of energy into specific areas. That's why meditation is very positive and very necessary for us to become more involved, evolved, sorry. So we have the body that is regulated by the mind and the mind has the ability to shift and open doorways to take us into the other dimensions, etc. The spirit is the part of ourselves that um, interacts in daily life. This is, this is what sort of, it's like saying what comes out of us and interacts with the life around us. That's our spirit. And our spirit is the one that is having the, the life experience here. It is influenced by the soul because the soul has the collection of everything, of every place that it has incarnated in the past and every world that it has been in. It comes with that. So we have the ability to sort of blend just a little bit with our soul, our spirit and our soul kind of touching each other, influencing each other. And the soul is, is the collection of the, all of the data. So when we leave, the spirit leaves, and it goes back into, it becomes part of that, uh, of that soul, that essence that has traveled throughout the, the universe, dimensional worlds, other planets, other realms. This information is part of the information that these beings gave to me back in 1988 about how we interact and why it is that we are not, that every single one of us is, quote, extraterrestrial. The, the question is, how much do we remember about where we're from? It's like saying, I'm from this, you know, it's another, it's another part of the phenomenon that I, that I hope at some point will sort of move past, because it's like saying, what country are you from? Well, I'm from Canada. You're from the UK. Davey's from where? Scotland. <laughs> Scotland. <laughs> Davies from Scotland, but really, are we different? No, we are human beings, so we're all the same, right? It's about that oneness. Same thing with the extraterrestrials. When we start to say Sirius, Arturian, Pleiadian, this, that, and the other thing, we do have to look at it differently because culturally they'll be different. Think of it as different countries, different cultures. But are they different? That's the question. Are they different? If you take it all the way back into the history of where we came from, none of us are different. Hmm. The question uh, is, how involved are we? Yeah, yeah. I, I think also at the moment there's just so many people um, coming into awareness of, uh, seems, seems to be a time of memory coming back. And there's lots of people I'm speaking to now. And it's not all positive, I have to tell you. You know, a lot of my work is about um, helping people to kind of recalibrate and also uh, harmonize the trauma. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's a great, and, and some of it is just by speaking, allowing them to have a platform, whether it's public or not, it doesn't matter. But that is, you know, it's a big shock when this comes down the pipe. And that just brings me on to something that we'd mentioned before, which um, is, I can only call it the ripple effect. Out of all yes. of this that we're doing, the drumbeat that's rolling beneath yes. our feet and our, you know, in our hearts and minds here, what do you think this is, or, or how do you see it playing out thus far from, from your own experience, this ripple effect of the extraterrestrial element coming in and uh, perhaps the awareness of our true history beginning to just create a bit of a dawning in us? Well, the ripple effect is definitely something that they talked about in 1988, and it's a repetitive message that they talk about, you know, when I have my dreams, my visions, my um, te telepathic communication even now. It's something that they actually talk about, ripple effect. I think that in order to understand the ripple effect of, the, of ufology, we have to go back another world in order to understand this, okay? So... As it was described to me as I was on the UFO, they said that in the third world, 
it's, it's it gets a bit convoluted here because in the third world the physical forms of bodies that we lived in were quite atypical of what we see now however there was one there was a very big difference and that is that the type of energy that flowed through us was different we were able to have much more open contact with the other dimensional worlds okay we we were much more easily able to astral travel interdimensionally travel all of these you know extraordinary things that had to do with the the let's call it the electricity the, the amount of energy that was flowing through our bodies at the time now there were good parts to this and there were bad parts to this because the souls some of the souls that came in were not responsible um, meaning they they wanted to act like a bunch of children and they they were creating they were creating technology for example that would have been it would have um, torn the space time uh, reality and the different worlds apart okay because of their um, lack of caring and wanting to 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 just exper experiment it's like a lot of experimentation was going on so this is one of the reasons why the, the third world ended was because there were it was climaxing to a point where it would have destroyed and sent ripples out into the very existence itself irreparable ripples so what they did was they destroyed they took some people off the planet in the third world and then they brought them back in the form of indigenous this is what they told me on on the ufo when they did that they also brought with them a new form of human being this is when new vehicles meaning new bodies were created that had a more toned down uh, ability to to carry only a certain amount of, of of electricity let's say easy to describe that way um, it could only carry so much the brain could only handle so much so we had to evolve and over time this evolution would be taking place and partly because the human body would evolve where we are in the solar system where we are in the universe where the planets are um, and also because of the interaction with the star beings with the to other dimensional worlds and the future past present and future travelers that go back and forth so the ripple effect is that in 1988 they said you need to work with bringing this energy in from the other dimensions and just release it into this world and as you walk down the street this is exactly what they said to me as you walk down the street release this energy out into the world and allow people to if they choose to pick it up so it's like walking leaving droplets drops of water as you walk and then someone else walks into it and it touches their energy and changes them so this is how the ripple effect has been taking place this is what evolution is this is what the evolving is it is about our ability as human beings to bring in this new energy and to then share it to slowly infiltrate I don't think people will like that word but it's okay to to influence infiltrate the energies that surround us now this can be done for positive and it can be done for negative and that's what I think freaks people out and that's what's happening the positive is that for a lot of experiencers we all of a sudden start to do this and then start advocating for the protection and for peace on earth for harmony with nature etc etc and when we bring in energy we bring in the love we bring in the light we, we share that that then influences the people around us the the air the plants the animals everything it, it invigorates it and I've seen miracles happen with this kind of energy miracles um, so this is what the ripple effect is, and this is what they, the tall blondes talk about a lot, is that and that's so, what we're all doing. Yeah, so when you said that you, you, you know, go out there and you just release it, exactly what specifically are you releasing? I mean, is it like from a meditative stage, or, or is it an intention that, okay, now I'm sending out love and light? I just wonder because 
you know, I, I do, I do kind of maybe my own version of that as a, you know, when I'm driving out, I visualize a snowplow kind of affair of light and that that's just plowing through the, the roadway, filling it with light and, you know, good stuff and that that, you know, goes out onto the carriageways of up for other cars that, that people and their lives will be influenced by the light energy and I just mean that for their highest and best potential and whatever that means for them. So is it similar to that or is it completely different? No, it's similar because um, I think that everyone, uh, you know, most people will have some slightly different uh, visual accompaniment to to what it is that um, that energy quote kind of looks like to them. So the visual of what we have in our minds may be different, but as long as we are working with uh, heart-centered energy, love, light, um, harmony, peace, yeah. uh, that kind of thing, and we're thinking about that, then that's what we're going to bring in and share. And this has been a process. Okay, so Joanne, we met in 2009 in Laughlin, Nevada. We did. I didn't mention and, that. Yes. And um, you know the conferences, the UFO conferences. One of the one of the things in this phenomenon that is incredible is that we can meet someone, and within a matter of an within a matter of hours, we kind of just attract each other and and feel that we're we're one person almost because of this phenomenon. But what is that? What is that? And to me, and what I understand about that is that we, it would be saying your energy and mine is almost identical. So we very easily come together and then bond, you see. It's not like saying oil and water. It's like saying water and water. You're water, I'm water. Therefore, when we meet, we recognize each other and blend and we're, we're, we're bound together through that same element, you see. It's like mm -hmm. being the same element. So when we bond in those ways with people who have had different, even different experiences spiritually, mentally, physically, emotionally, those are all energies that we bond together because we're, that's what energy we're walking with and carrying, you see? So when um, through ufology, there's a lot of spiritual messages that are being shared by contactees and even abductees. And it is very interesting because even 27 years ago, when I was meeting people back then who had had contact, um, we already knew that this was what we were supposed to do, was to let this energy out so that we could do this. But I want to be clear, this energy is has free will attached to it, meaning if the person that walks through it doesn't want it, it's not going to be kept by them. It's not going to be affecting them if they truly don't want it. If they do on any level, then it will come in and start to to support. It's like building wa building walls of support around our molecules to help us get stronger and be built up, you see? And ufology, of all the things that we're doing with the history, the the chaos of it and the scarier aspects because i've had i've had some pretty frightening experiences also i i have um it's not all it's not all bubbles and light <laughs> it's <laughs> it's it's mm. it can be very very frightening and even if i saw one of them walk up to me on the window right now and you know and i i saw one at my window i, I don't know how i'd react even now, with all of this, I don't know how I'd react because their energy is so different and so powerful. So, so where, where, where are you and the Hopi, for example, because I, I know there's a close link there, in, in terms of um, sort of the next years or one year, two years, is, is there, um, is there a, a, I was going to say a process, it's not the right word, is there an expectation over this next few months or years or whatever from their side, from your side, or from working with them, 
that they expect to see or is this still a very fluid um, time, you know, a very fluid situation? Because we know that there are things that are pretty, pretty darn, you know, dreadful on the horizon that if unleashed, then, you know, I don't know how humanity is going to, you know, hold on. Um, and I just don't know about that. But where, where are you and where are the Hopi on that? Well, what I can share is that, um, again, uh, when it comes to Hopi prophecies, they're very complex. And there are, again, I would just state this, that there are people out there who claim to be part of, um, uh, uh, you know, other prophecies out there that have to do with Hopi. And they're, they're convoluted, um, made-up stories. Okay, mm -hmm. so be wary of that. Again, another person I'm kind of directing you at, directing people to be wary of. Um, there, you know, nothing is as it appears to be, is what, is what the, the message of the beings always is. Nothing is as it appears to be. However, when it comes to the prophecies of the Hopi, I don't, I will never come forward unless they ask me to, to talk about their specific prophecies. They did once. They did ask me to do it once. Um, but they're very, very complex. There's so many of them. People think that there's only a handful. There's actually hundreds and hundreds of prophecies from Hopi. Hundreds oh, okay. of them. I was looking at the major sort of nine that I'd read about. And most people, that's all that they know. And the reason yeah. why, I, you know, it's important to share that because it shows that there's a lot that we're going to be experiencing. Some of those things have come to pass. Some of them, they're still waiting to happen. They do not share their prophecies with people because they don't want to scare them. They don't want to put the bad energy into the world and make people start thinking about them. That's why they don't share them. They don't want people thinking about it because the more you think about something, the more it's created. That is the words of the Hopi right there. What I can say as far as the world uh, history of prophecies um, because a lot of people from the indigenous communities are coming forward saying these, these prophecies of ours are coming true now. Um, we, we have to stand up and we need to stand together. So that is definitely taking place. As far as the prophecies of what the extraterrestrials have shared with me personally from 1988 all the way until today, what they're saying is that we're running out of time. Now, that's made clear just by looking at what's happening in the world, but how is that taking place? Um, what can we expect? Well, everything has been happening in waves, waves of energy from different people that have come forward, waves of energy with different events that have happened in the world. And what they're saying, the ETs are saying now, is that we're going to be taking a little bit of a jump forward as far as this information because more people that are very uh, that have positions within the world community as far as um, fame let's say they're going to be coming forward and asking harder questions they're going to be um, making statements that are going to be uh, related to ufology or spiritualism that are going to sort of blow people away and go wow I, you know this is great, and it's going to open the dialogue up to be a little bit wider. But there are certain things that are coming that are going to be challenging, and they're continued to be, as you can see, in the world. So the message from them is, from the extraterrestrials, is that we really do need to keep focused on what our tasks are, what we feel our mission is, either personally or for in service to others, and that uh, it's not, we're not at the end game. We are not at the end game yet, meaning there's still time to bring reversal to the damaging effect of our future. But we are getting very close to that cutoff time. Everybody tells me that. Honestly, every single person with varying degrees of fear, panic, and also, you know, a laissez fair, it's going to be fine, don't worry. We're just where we're meant to be. I tell you what, I did want to ask you that um, I uh, forgot about earlier on, just talking about the any kind of rip in the space-time continuum from World Three people <clears throat> potential. Do you think that there was any such event that happened with a Philadelphia experiment or any possible CERN um, firing up potential? Do you, do you do you see anything from that so, there? Because 
man. Well, well, I know it's two different things. I mean, the Philadelphia experiment, I definitely heard that there was a, 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 rip, a ripple, a, a ripple, a rip in the space time continuum um, from, from, you know, back in 40, what was it, 45, 47? It happened, I can't remember now. But anyway, way back then, and they don't know, every 12 years, there's a cycle of that, I don't know, some aperture widening or something like that. But do you know if that happened? Or is that, you know, is that a, just an urban legend? Would you know? No, I don't believe, I don't, you know, I, yeah. kind of just checking in with that, uh, as far as um, the Philadelphia experiment, definitely they, they opened up doorways, but I think that the doorways that were opened could not possibly have, have done the damage that what, of what you're talking about, ripping things. Um, in my opinion, it still may it still may have an effect. Don't okay. get me wrong, what people are saying, but to use cor maybe correct language, because if there was an yeah. actual rip, we would know it. It would affect everything, because you yeah. can't stop something like that. That something like that really changes things drastically. If there's any kind of a quote rip that takes place, mm -hmm. as far as what CERN is doing, I'm actually very concerned about what CERN's doing because of the um, the physics that were taught to me by the extraterrestrials. See, in the center of of what the nucleus, the actual bare bones like you know of what they're trying to get at is like saying it's it's endless fusion energy Boom. and what they don't realize is that when you get to the very center 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 which you can almost not do because it's endless okay but once you do get to a certain layer within that um, within that atom okay mm -hmm. it's like saying um, you know how when you have an egg and you put pressure on side to side, you can put a lot of pressure on the sides and it won't break, but then you go from, you know, from tip, tip, yeah. top to bottom, you can put pressure and then side to side, it just cracks and breaks really easily. It's sort of like that with CERN. Once you get to a certain point, if you let if you let out what's in the center, it has spikes on it. This is what the ETs have told me. It has spikes on it, so little energy, you know. Yeah, you spikes. Know. And if you crack it open, it comes from the center out. Now the problem is that it's like the egg. It, in order to get it out of the center, it's super hard because it has it has a coat on it. And within that, it's bashing up against this coating that it can't break through. But take it out of there and then have it come back down, it's going to it's gonna smash everything that it comes into contact with. Okay. That's the concern. Yeah. So it does have the potential to, to do harm. Yeah, I mean, that's what, that's what a lot of people think and, you know, believe it's definitely possible. Well, we're coming up to um, nearly our two hours. It's amazing how time flies on this show, honestly. But Miriam, is, I think it's been wonderful, and I'm really appreciative of you spending time with us. And just take people through your website and contact details, please. And you've got a couple of websites, but you want to flag up the main one. I'll let you do that for the moment. Thank you. Um, my, my main website is bluestarprophecy.com. And I have, uh, there's a lot of information on the website, a free download of my PDF book, Blue Star Fulfilling Prophecy. And I really hope people check me out on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, which I'm going to be starting to do um, a video blog that's going to be sharing more information a little bit more in depth. And uh, they can also ask me questions through my website or even the YouTube anywhere. Um, and eventually, hopefully, I'll be able to get to some of these questions. Not all of them, but I will do my very best. And also, I work um, as a volunteer at an organization called The Great Gathering. And that is at thegreatgathering.org. And I hope that people check that work out as well. And um, 
uh, get involved. I mean, it's important that we all step up to the to the challenge of of the times that we're in, in being in service to others, so that we can rebalance the planet and put it back onto a course of peace rather than a course of destruction. Um, very important, and I'm thrilled that I had this time. I was a little tired when we started, but now that we're done, I I, I could go I could go another hour. It's been it's been great, and thank you. Thank you both, um, Steve and Joanne, for, for having me. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that. And um, I would like to just say that, um, like all of us, Miriam is doing all her work and the help with the Hopi on Fresh Air. So please, folks, send out the message. A donation would be really helpful, really gratefully received. And um, I just want to say thank you all for listening. This has been absolutely great. Stephen, as usual, you've done an absolutely grand job. And we've just got a couple of minutes. So if there's any last thing you'd like to share with us, Miriam, just before we sign off, that would be lovely. So well, I'll be over there in Canada. Thank you. I'll share something a little bit uh, interesting because I've been sitting here with um, this in the background. Uh -huh. I don't know if you can see it. And this is actually from Hopi. Okay. And it's it's one of the the Kachina dolls that they have. Oh. Um, it's a, a sacred Kachina doll. You can you can purchase them when you're in Hopi. They're beautiful pieces of art, but they're also um, part of the the culture and the history and the teaching of history um, of their of their ceremonies. And this one is actually the Blue Star Kachina. How wonderful! Well, that sounds like a wonderful note to end on. So once again, thank you all very much for listening, everybody. Thank you for the questions, that ones that came in. I think you were all quite riveted because we haven't had so many this week. But thank you, Miriam, and we'll see you again, I hope, and perhaps catch up with you in another few months' time when we'll be in a, a different incarnation ourselves. <laughs> so for the moment, and I hope, I don't know what your, just tell me what your weather's like before I finally sign off. Is it snowy it's yet over there? very, very cold. <laughs> Yes, yes, I, I knew it would be, but <laughs> we haven't got snow here yet, though I hear they had it in London a couple of days ago, a little flurry, but not not like the Canadian style. No, So anyway, I will just say thanks very much again, Stephen, that's wonderful, and we will see you next week for another Amash Files. Thank you, Miriam Delicado, and the Blue Star Prophecy. Catch her there. Thank you very much, Stephen. You can play us out. That's lovely. Amash Files. Of the book, which is a PDF that you can download, folks, and I do recommend it. I've got through a little bit of it. It's a great read. Blue Star Fulfilling Prophecy in which she shares details of her contact experiences with tall blondes, our great aunt's ancestors, and since childhood, Miriam has been in touch with other worlds and energies of life beyond our Earth's dimensions. So I think it's time for us to say hello to Miriam. Welcome to the Amash Files. Thank you for joining us. Hello, and I uh, just want to say uh, thank you for having me. It's great to be here, and um, I was really listening very intently to the to the intro that you were sharing, Joanne, and um, I have some things that, uh, as we move along, I'd like to sort of give my input on, because Lovely. I found that what you were sharing was very interesting, and yeah. uh, it relates to some of my, my knowledge as well. Uh, wonderful. Well, it really does seem to be a time of stripping down, stripping back, it, it's really ultra painful. It is not an easy time, but it is a time of great growth. And also those who are standing beside us, wow. And those who we didn't know were there, how fantastic. And sometimes these are very new connections and they're soul connections. And you don't need the 20 odd years to, to know that. You can just know it in a moment. And that's also really exciting. I've got one or two of those coming in and that's also beautiful and uh, relevant and we mustn't dismiss those either and be shy of them that's that's it it's about trusting ourselves to to trust so um yeah it, it's a good one so miriam welcome welcome and i know um that you have had a lot of experiences right from the get-go and just want to say that um you're in canada but your your dad was from yugoslavia your mom was from germany 
And right. you, you've been brought up in Canada, as I understand it. That's right. And so what a wonderful mix there is there. But also just talking about families, how your father seems to have had some interesting connections that will become obvious down the line. So here again, we've got this lineage thing going on of this contact continuing through the line. And we'll explore that as well down the road. But I tend to, to find it really interesting for people if we can just start at the beginning and just tell us a little bit about your, your early years, because I know right from a, a very young child, you are very aware of uh, being a bit different. Yes. Yeah. Well, my, 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 my history as far as my entire life uh, is concerned is, is, is interesting. Um, it's sometimes it can be a bit spotty to try and share this massive uh, story in, in the course of just a few minutes on a radio program. Um, but to talk about the ET contact, I'd like to start there, which happened when I was 22, and then uh, I'll give a bit of an overview to my childhood. Um, so, you know, growing up, I was a very you know, I was just like most other children, or so it seemed. Um, but I didn't, I didn't know at the time that I was a little different in the sense that uh, even when I was about two years old, I would try to read people's minds and things like that. So if, even from a very young age, I had certain abilities that were not, quote, of the norm um, of society. And then as I got a bit older, I had a lot of, quote, psychic abilities that started popping up and creeping up. Um, about the age of nine, ten, they started to become very strong. And during my teen years, I mean, I was very hooked into other worlds. But I didn't understand it. There wasn't any mentors around or places for me to go to figure things out. I was literally on my own. Um, my close friends and family knew about these gifts, but, you know, I didn't, I didn't talk about them very often because they really scared people, actually. Right. With this person who's contacted me now, with somebody else who's written this book. He said, it was a small hotel astride a decidedly smelly smoke, uh, soap factory situated amidst the downtown splendors of Warrington, and that's in the mid of England. Not the most obvious choice for a moment of intergalactic history. 20 years later, this person, the alien, is still quietly trudging the UFO lecture circuits near their home, again in the middle of England, but he has never had any significant pu publicity for his claim, nor does he even uh, want that. It seems he goes about his perceived mission with decorum and patience, despite occasionally interjecting, the time is now running out. Most people who meet him will not have a clue that he is anything but a tall, bearded person with piercing eyes and the odd philosophies who used to make jellies for a living. But if this person's self-conviction is to be believed, he is a good deal more than that. He says that his spirit is from elsewhere, inhabiting an earthly body, which he finds restricting. He is here to warn of disasters looming and cites mystic prophecies from dubious sources. Now he's meaning Nostradamus, um, as anyone who might quote the weather report. This person has been an influence in my life, that's the author, for many, in many subtle ways for a long time. Superficially, at least, the story is absurd, of course, but there are more secret corners of his experience than ha that have made me sit up and take notice and not to be as entirely dismissive as I might be or any other logical person might be. So this is about trusting as well. And I am trusting this person with my time, my energy, and we will in due course meet. Now, what they're also talking about, just to finish off before we have a song and then we're going to meet my wonderful guest for this evening, and I'll tell you about her in a moment. Um, he is talking about some very deep, arcane mysteries and some incredible artifacts that are to be found around the British Isles. And some of those um, artifacts we'll know as the Ark of the Covenant, the menorah, amongst others. Now, I'll be reporting in due course once I've had a meeting with this person, which will probably be in the new year now, and um, see what I really think 
about their story. But this is, you know, again, another level of trust and something that uh, we are challenged with. So it's about, it seems, this moment, this time in our lives about getting the people that we truly have a connection with, a resonance with, on side. And for those who aren't, whether they show themselves to our face or we're shown it by some other means, it means we have to let them go. And we have to be really strong about that. It's a really interesting time. So we are going to play our first song. And then we are going to have Miriam Delicata come and share with us her wonderful story. And part of her wonderful story began in 1988 with an incredible encounter. But we will get to that down the line. Miriam has also had a lot of, um, a lot of uh, links with the Hopi and the Hopi uh, Blue Star Kachina prophecy we'll be talking about down the line as well. And her website is the Blue Star Prophecy com and you can check that out as we play this song which is about three and a half minutes long so take it away i think it's spaceman by the killers thank you we'll speak to moon in just a moment and i think that may mean we are back so hello and welcome again to the amash files and i have with me miriam delicado of the blue star prophecy.com website Miriam is a world-recognized extraterrestrial conductee and the author of whatever you like. And you can say or believe that it's not real. It doesn't matter to me. I know it's real for these folks, and that's where I am for them. Now, uh, to, to that end, I've also had some interesting things that have come, up, come under my radar. And one of those things is a guy who's contacted me a few months ago. And I just want to share a little bit of what they, they've said, because... He's been leading me email by email over several months to a point where there's some information um, which I will share in time, but I wanted to share a little bit about what he, where he was leading me and how he was leading me, and part of that with, with some ancient texts, starting with Nostradamus. And I am going to have to use the old-fashioned magnifying glass here um, because <laughs> This is the kind of text I'm going to have to just read a little bit of. But just so you know, and this, because I want to tell you a little bit about this person. And this person has been mentioned in a book, um, and I'll tell you about that in a second. But part of this book called The Star Child Mystery says this. According to some witnesses, aliens claim to have seeded star children on Earth for many millennia and say that great religious figures were alien representatives. I have heard from some sources, including contactees and space nap victims, as well as government figures on both sides of the Atlantic, that this is the true reason for the official UFO cover-up. And that um, admitting the reality of aliens is actually no big deal. However, however, coping with the religious turmoil would be a nightmare if it were made public that aliens claim to have manipulated most sorry major religious belief systems and who wants to take you know who wants to deal with that who wants to take responsibility for that revelation that religion perhaps is an alien pr exercise in some ways so that was kind of just a little bit of briefing and then they showed me a piece of text from um, a Nostradamus text. Now, apparently, in 1994, there was um, in the Vatican uh, several pages found, and uh, a guy called Ramati translated them. And this is what he has said. Let me just see if I can get this read for you. Um, hang on, I've got the wrong little bit. <laughs> Bear with me here. So it says. Um, the screens of the English have not allowed the extraterrestrials a peaceful descent. That's descent as in coming to the ground. I have seen how many wise ones have been killed. The United States has been made to think that the angels are beasts, some kind of telepathic, um, some kind of telepathic Russian animal. And all the English think of is hunting them down and they themselves come down here and are killed by a defection of some kind of, by a defection kind of contact 
if defective, I beg your pardon. So it's really difficult to read this time you're writing. It is um, imperative that Europe and the United States observe with utmost respect the gifts from the stars, since it is in um, sorry, since it is rarest in those countries to find peers who will testify as to their thought. So it's just a little bit of telling you about what's been what has been seen what has been seen on this planet and what's going on now one of the things that that has been written in this book as well is about this chap and this is what i want because this is who i'm in contact with and it says the location for this extraterrestrial contact was not especially salubrious so this was a contact especially back then so Life went on. I, I moved from my small town. Are you there, Miriam? No. <laughs> okay, have we, have we lost sound on Miriam? Lost everything. Lost everything. Okay. okay. Am I still on? <clears throat> there she is. She's back. Oh. Okay. Um, I was with some people on uh, driving on a highway in Canada. We were driving from northern British Columbia to Vancouver, and some very strange lights came up behind us, some big balls of white light. And, you know, the brain has a tendency to try and figure things out in a rational way. Whatever you think rational, you know, think rational is. That's yeah. whatever your perception is, that's what you're going to see. I will so, just say, Miriam, sorry, just to interrupt the flow there, I'm sorry about that, but we did lose you just for a, a few seconds leading up to that story that you were, you were in a trip. So just that you were on a trip here and, and you were already um, on your way. So sorry about that. It's just to, that we lost you there. <laughs> so just to say that you were, in fact, on a trip and this is, this is what was going on. Right. I was driving on a highway with um, three other adults and a child in a car, and these lights started following us. And we thought it was maybe a big truck because it was a bit higher up than a normal vehicle. And uh, there was a lot of strange things that were happening as these lights would come up behind us. A, a radio station would come on in the car. Um, the, the lights would fall, you know, simply just fall back and, and disappear if we went through a small town or if a car was coming towards us. This went on for several hours, and after taking sort of a nap in the back of the car, um, myself and another woman went up to the drivers in, in the front. I was the passenger, she was the driver. And at that point, um, these lights were still continuing to follow us. And we were getting very nervous about the situation because it was very, very, very odd. And eventually, uh, we went through a town, a small town, and it's a, it was about it's about two miles, I think, from one end to the other that you can see, you know, from one end to the other. And coming in, you come in from a bit of a hill, and then you leave going up a bit of a hill. And when you do, you're completely in forested area again. So we did this, and I looked behind me, and I said, there is no way that those lights can catch us now. None. There's no way. And then literally, literally, I blinked, and the lights were there. And the woman that was driving started screaming, saying, I, you said they weren't there. What's happening? I don't understand. And finally, I screamed at her, and I said, pull over the car, pull over the car which of course she didn't want to, she was terrified. So was I, really. And, um, but I said, no, it's not you they want, it's me. And this came, I think, this thought came as a result of uh, a dream that I'd had earlier, a couple of hours earlier, when two beings came to me sort of in the astral world and said to me, um, we are coming for you soon, do not be afraid, we are your friends, we are your family. So the car, pulls over onto the side of the road. All of the, ch the child and the three adults are, are motionless, completely motionless. And I look around and there's light everywhere. The two big, huge balls of light are behind the car. And when I look in front, there's a, a UFO that has almost like mist uh, 
coming off of it and it was dark so it was very it, it was like the mist was was full of light Hello and welcome to program 58 of the Amash Files. And as you know, it's Tuesday. It is Tuesday and it's the 24th of November. Thank goodness I'd written that down. I've not long come off a train from London and I'm having a blonde moment. So, <laughs> and as you'll know, we are on peoplesinternetradio.com and thank you to Stephen Roberts for hosting us this evening. And thank goodness it's a bit warmer. Gosh, when I first arrived in London, I was freezing. It was a bit of a shock. It's normally uh, a bit warmer up there. But anyway, I wanted to just mention something that's been coming up more and more and more. And I'm sure it's, it's uh, the same for all of us. And, it, and it's this. Um, and it's about trust. This is very interesting. I'm having it sort of shoved right under my nose time and time again. And, um, and I know some of the people close to me are as well. And... I just wanted to, to sort of flag up a little bit of my experience this last few days. I, I went and stayed with some of the most, uh, the most amazing friend. I've known her for many years. And we had meditations and we, we, had, we shared time. And, it, you know, it's not all about, um, you know, the spiritual stuff. Sometimes it's about, it's just about having fun and a sing song. And some of these gals and guys are Latin. And, and so they love to, to share and that is just amazing. But these relationships that I've had with these folks, especially the friend I stayed with, has been built up over many years. But right from the get-go, this was a person who just captivated my heart. She was a complete love bomb. She just is open. And um, when I say open, she's open to the possibility of everybody embracing her love and her love being accepted by others. And it, and it really is just very unusual and, and very beautiful. And... Um, there are sort of three of us in, in the group um, that are very, very close, and we call ourselves the Three Musketeers. And, and those two other musketeers, they, they know that um, they could trust me with their souls and their bodies and their lives. And likewise, um, you know, this group, it, it's so amazing. And one of the, my friends said, you do know, Joanne, just how unusual this is. And I thought, you know, it's been a part of my life for 25 more years, and I thought, wow, is it, is it really that unusual? And, and maybe it is, and it seems to me, though, that the idea of, of trust is being brought up time and time again, and there's been one or two issues around myself where I've had to accept and realize that um, one or two people I thought I was close to, not quite in the way I am with those folks, um, that I'd invested a lot of time and energy and love and care in, um, had just turned and um, and as if it was nothing, as if it was nothing, and um, had demonstrated that they thought it was nothing. And this hasn't just happened once. This has happened, uh, you know, a few times for me. And I know it's happening around some people I know. So it's as if this trust issue, we, you know, if we are being, um, I hate the word scammed, but let's just use it because it's common these days, by false false friends, let's call it, but false trusts. Um, it's amazing, you know, I'm, I'm perhaps a, a, a little bit gullible or naive. I take people and trust people that they show me themselves and, until I know otherwise. Um, but I don't go out to see the otherwise. I, I, you know, hopefully those discerning antenna are well operational. But um, it is an astonishing thing. And to that end, I have to do a lot of trusting and people certainly have to trust me with the most intimate details of uh, their lives often in doing what I do, which is to provide a platform for people to have a safe place in which they can talk about their, let's, I'm gonna call it extraterrestrial contacts. You can call it 